depending on where you are in the world, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar, Don't Let Security Be the Downfall of Your Microsoft Skype for Business Deployment. Cyber criminals have been using SIP, or Session Initiation Protocol, as an entry point for denial of service, exfiltration of intellectual property, and theft of telephony services. In fact, this has been so prevalent that more than half of all voice over IP cyber attacks are now SIP-based, per a report from IBM Security Intelligence Group. As more enterprises move their communications to SIP and Skype for Business, there must be an understanding of what is needed to control and secure real-time communications at network borders. Saunas is leading the fight against bad actors, teaming up with system integrators to implement policies that block unauthorized traffic on your communications network. In this webinar, Aero Systems Integration joins Saunas to share real-world examples showing you how to protect your Skype for Business deployment. You will learn about the essentials of a successful architecture and the most common pitfalls to avoid. Our presenters for today's webinar are two experts in voice network security. Omar Kabir, SBC Edge Product Manager at Sonus, has spent the last decade bringing products to market that help secure enterprise voice networks, and Patrick Payette, Director of Microsoft Solutions at Aero Systems Integration, has worked directly with enterprises to implement voice network security strategies. During this webinar, please submit your questions to the chat window at the bottom left corner of your screen, and we will attempt to answer some questions near the end of the webinar. And now we will send things over to Patrick Payette, who will get this webinar started. Thanks, John. Uh, very excited to be here. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm in Seattle, so good morning to the West Coast, and I guess still good morning to the Central, and good afternoon to the East. And if you're international, I have no idea what time zone you're in, so good day. Um, as John pointed out, let's just make sure if I advance the slides, it all works. Looks like that still works. I appreciate that. Um, hey, that's me. That's what I look like. And as John said, um, I work for Aerosystems Integration. I help run our Microsoft practice here. And really what that means is um, we focus primarily on the Office 365 stack. That includes Skype for Business, Microsoft Exchange, Exchange Online, Azure AD, Azure AD Premium, SharePoint, uh, pretty much everything except for Dynamics. And with that, I've been doing a lot with Surface devices, um, particularly Surface Hub. If you haven't seen Surface Hub, you should. It's great. It's fantastic. Um, and obviously, as things are moving more and more to the cloud, we're doing more and more with, with Windows Azure in terms of moving infrastructure up there. Um, that's my email address. That's where I live. That's my picture. If you have any questions about that, put that in the chat window. Happy to take that. Um, so first off, I'd like to just talk about who AeroSI is. Um, so as John pointed out, AeroSI is a Sonus partner. Uh, I, I, I do a lot of stuff day to day uh, with Sonus, and we have quite a few other business units that work with Sonus as well. Um, but I get the question a lot, who, who the heck is Aero? Um, if you live in Colorado, you probably know who Aero is. Aero is the largest employer in, in Colorado. Um, but all up, uh, Aero SI is part of Aero Electronics, which is, I think we've moved up from Fortune 119. Um, we're a little higher now. Uh, we used to be right behind Raytheon and right in front of Northrop Grumman. Uh, but all up, what Aero does is we distribute and help design electronics components uh, throughout the world. Uh, we're, I believe we're the world's largest electronics components distributor. Um, but specifically the SI, the Systems Integration Division of Aero, we focus on the integration stack, right? So. Um, integrating disparate voice systems, data networks, building data centers, doing you know, power build-outs, just about everything you can think of that you can plug in, uh, we work on. Um, and in fact, what I like to say is that by the time you've had your morning cup of coffee, you've touched something Arrow has worked on at least five times. Um, from the smart alarm clock sitting on your nightstand like I have, to your mobile device, to your maybe smart coffee maker, uh, we're in just about everything. And, um, here I'm just showing you the different pieces and parts that make Arrow interesting. Um, and you see a couple of images there on the right, and these are just some real-world examples of the components that Arrow helps to distribute. So the top there is the, the Philae Comet lander that landed on a comet. Um, yeah, there's Arrow pieces and parts in there. And then there's the Arrow SAM car, the semi-autonomous car that allows our, our um, quadriplegic driver, Sam Schmidt, to drive using only his head. And then, as I said, I focus primarily on the Microsoft stack. So that includes things like Skype for Business, and you know, they're running on a Surface, which we also do, um, surf, other Surface devices, Exchange, SharePoint. Again, everything but Dynamics, pretty much, is what we work on. Um, one of the coolest parts of Arrow is that value recovery piece on the right. And what that is is it's a, it's a green uh, disposal methodology for 
uh, IT assets. So we take IT assets, um, securely wipe them, refurbish them, and reintroduce them into the market for a profit. Um, and you can actually go online to aerodirect.com and, and see some of that refurb gear out there in the world. So th those are just some of the things that AeroSI does. Um, but what I want to focus on today is, is the voice technology that we help support, particularly things like Skype for Business, how that works with Sonus, um, how we play with firewalls, how we play with security, the threats that we see, the threats that we mitigate, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so I think there's a poll question here. Oh, geez, there is one. I'm, not sure. I'm hoping everybody can see that because I sure can. I'd really love it if everybody could respond to so the question here being, have you previously deployed SIP trunks in your environment? And by that I mean as, as opposed to like PRIs. Um, have you got a little music here to make the time go by easier? This is more to help me keep track of how long it's been. That's good enough, right? So appreciate that. I've got the responses here. I'm going to answer yes because I've definitely seen that. Um, so looking at the results, so wow, quite a few people. So SIP trunks have become more and more prevalent. Um, we're seeing quite a bit in cost savings when you move to SIP trunks as opposed to PRIs. Um, or digital lines or analog copper, whatever you, whatever you might have. Um, and, and the cost benefit of SIP trunking is, is such that you can increase the size, the scope at, at a fairly easy cost, right? If you've got a couple of T1s coming into your voice environment, if you need more channels, you've got to come in and terminate another T1. Right? If you've got a SIP trunk, you can call your SIP provider and say, hey, we're getting into the busy season, I need 100 more you know, ports or lines, and they can just burst that open. And it makes turning up new voice services quite a bit easier. And one of the early concerns with SIP trunking was um, emergency call handling, but that's been addressed long, long time now. Um, so we're seeing, just like the poll shows here, quite a bit um, of movement into the SIP trunk space. Now as we look at the cloud environment um, and, and the quote unquote shift to the cloud, uh, you know, what I focus on is the Office 365 stacks. I'm not talking about Azure or Amazon EC2 or anything like that. Um, but here we're talking about the productivity workload. Um, <laughs> I remember when Office 365 was called BPOS, uh, Business Process Online Service, I think, years ago. And, and it had a, <laughs> had a little bit of a takeoff problem. But once Office 365 hit the ground, um, we saw more and more in terms of migration, particularly on email. I think <laughs> just about every customer that I work with, the first workload that we even talk about moving to the cloud is exchange for email. But what we're seeing more and more and more is Skype for Business workload. So if you're not familiar with Skype for Business, I'll go over it really quickly in a second, but if you're familiar with OCS 2007 or Microsoft Link Server, the, the natural evolution was to Skype for Business. And you know, initially when Skype for Business Server was out and Link Server was out, it's a pretty complex thing to deploy. It takes weeks, sometimes months to get Skype for Business deployed securely and working. And we're seeing more and more of that workload shifting to Office 365. People are saying, you know, I don't want to build out these servers. I just want IAM in presence, maybe a little voice work, maybe some conferencing and meeting stuff, and so I'm going to move that to the cloud. Um, and <laughs> the numbers don't lie. Uh, the deployments of Skype for Business have skyrocketed. I think it's like 90% of Fortune 500 companies are using Skype for Business, Arrow included. And it, there's even been more announcements at Microsoft, uh, what's it called, Inspire this year, um, formerly WPC, where Office 365 is going to get <laughs> merged with um, what they're calling, what is it, Microsoft 365. So a couple of new 365s coming, but um, the, the, the move to the cloud is undeniable. It's happening. People are doing it, and we're supporting it. Um, and this quote kind of speaks to that, right? This is from the IHS technology um, um, market report from this quarter, it's the most recent one, where they're confirming, right, as, as Microsoft has been adding workload to Skype for Business Online, more and more people are taking advantage of it. Uh, several times per week at this point, I'm getting questions about how does cloud PBX work? What PBX functionality do I get? How do I take my Skype for Business on-prem environment and make it work with that? Um, you know, in, in a lot of cases, the Skype for Business deployment guys and gals are infrastructure guys and gals, not necessarily voice. So we can stand up servers and databases and get all that stuff going. But when it comes time to, say, interrupt with a PBX or <laughs> terminate SIP trunks, 
there's a lot of, you know, I don't, know, I don't even know where to start kind of questions and a lot of security questions. Um, most of the deployments that we do, Arrow aside combined with Sonus, we spend hours and hours and days and days talking about security, firewalls, certificates, IP addressing. How does this get routed to that and how do I do that securely? So again, if you haven't seen Skype for Business, uh, hey, that's my Skype for Business client. You can see it there running. That's my Windows client. Next to it's my iPhone client. And then I just I stole a picture of uh, the, the meeting view. Um, so Skype for Business, um, formerly Link Server, formerly OCS, formerly LCS too, um, it is, is Microsoft's UC and productivity tool, right? So it, most people know it for its IAM and presence capabilities, um, file sharing, desktop sharing, things like that. And now more and more people are seeing it uh, integrating with voice platforms, um, either doing click-to-call using call via work and interfacing with a PBX, or using the native Skype for Business experience for voice and dial tone. Uh, I'm seeing more and more customers talking about sunsetting their legacy third-party PBX environments and migrating that workload to Skype. Um, I, I could do three to four hours on what that looks like, but I really, what I, again, we really want to focus on is the security side of things. So if, you have, if you're using SIP trunks, you're probably using Skype. If you're that far along in your tech, you probably already know all this. But when looking at Skype and, and how we deploy it, there's the three main ways that we deploy Skype for business. First is online, right? And by online, I don't mean hosted in some sort of colo. I mean it's, it's in Office 365, right? So you go to your tenant, you assign the licenses, and pretty much a few minutes later, users can sign in, right? It's a pretty straightforward way of deploying it. Um, in the online or you know, Office 365 environment, if you want dial tone predominantly, um, that's going to be provided by Microsoft. It's an additional license. You can get phone numbers. You can get PSTN access. You, know, you can do quite a bit of stuff, but it's completely isolated from your network environment um, for the purposes of infrastructure. Obviously, your clients are still on-prem. But online is, you know, everything's online. There's nothing on-prem. In a hybrid mode, you would have a component of online, right? So I've got some users up in the cloud. But you know what? I've got some high-touch users that I need to keep on-prem. I've got some applications that we have to integrate with at the IP address and networking level, so I need servers on-prem. And you can do that, right? And that's what we do for a lot of customers that even want to shift to the cloud. I've got an existing environment on-prem. Let's build a connection to the Office 365 platform, migrate you, keep people on-prem, what have you. Um, in that case, you can do one or the other, right? You can even do both. In fact, my environment is running in a hybrid mode. Um, I'm, I'm a cloud PBX user, so my dial tone is in the cloud, but I've got quite a few users that are still on-prem. Um, and in that mode, you know, when I place and receive calls, it goes through Microsoft, and I've got other users that place and receive calls uh, through trunks um, that I have. And then on-prem is everything's on-prem. There's no Office 365 Skype. I might still have Office 365 for Exchange or SharePoint or something like that but predominantly everything's going to be on-prem for Skype, all the servers, all the users, and everything. It's important to note that in the hybrid mode, there's no splitting of workload, right? Users are either on-prem or online. There's none of this, well, I'm going to do voice on-prem, and everything, you know, all my IM and stuff is going to be online. It doesn't work that way. It's where does the user live, and both environments have the same workload. Now, when looking at voice and, and how Skype for Business Online works, as I said, predominantly you know, trunks are provided by Microsoft, but if you want to bring your own trunks to the party, you sure can. Um, and we'll talk about what that looks like. But you know, if you're online or if you're in a hybrid mode, you've got you know, Skype-supported devices like Polycom phones, Yaling phones, headsets from guys like Plantronics, Jabra, or Sennheiser. Um, I'm using a Jabra headset as a matter of fact. Um, but when you're online, every, everything is controlled from the online environment. And then as I said, if you're in a hybrid mode, it all depends on where the user lives. But in hybrid, you can absolutely have trunks on-prem. And in fact, with online, you can actually have trunks on-prem if you need it. And then if you're running everything completely on-prem, I mean, that's, that's a big server build-out. That's, that's quite a bit of architecture. But there's a piece there that says PSTN gateway right there top middle. And that's the part that tends to trip people up in addition to the edge components and pretty much anything relating to firewall and you know, how do I get traffic in here securely. And that's what we want to talk about. Um, so when we're talking about bringing trunks on-prem and, and 
opening up firewall rules and public IP addresses and all the stuff that goes into that, you know, this is when the question of security comes up and you know, what does that mean? Well, if we're coming from a really, really, really traditional PBX environment, um, by that I mean you've got analog phones on the desk, you've got digital phones on the desk, um, maybe you've got a whole VLAN set up for voice traffic by itself. And that's probably worked great, right? Digital analog phones are going to work pretty much no matter what. They only need a little bit of power. And a VLAN works great because you can segment off all of your telephones, and boom, there's, <laughs> there's your quality of service, and it's completely isolated from the network. But when you're putting Skype for Business in, you're converging a lot of that traffic, right? Skype for Business only speaks SIP or IP, if you want to think of it that way. And what that means is, well, Skype for Business does instant messaging and presence. It does peer-to-peer -peer audio, video, content sharing. It does meetings. It does file transfers. It does a lot of stuff that takes over the network, so to speak, right? And voice just happens to be one of those things. So VLANing doesn't work in that case because you can't VLAN off specific traffic. Uh, but what you can do is do QoS and, and, and packet tagging and make sure that your voice traffic gets, you know, prioritized, yada, yada, yada. But when you're doing voice on the network, it, and if you're doing voice over IP today, you already know all this, right? So what are the threats if I've got something public facing? Um, denial of service. So I've got one or many people just hammering my public IP or public DNS name in an effort to block it or bring it down, right? I'm trying to disrupt service. Um, toll fraud, which often talked about, um, but not seen all that often in the news, and when it is, it's in big numbers. Um, and I'll talk about what toll fraud is. And then sniffing and snooping are really just monitoring and reading traffic and, and media payload. Um, so what does a distributed denial of service look like? This is an application called the Low Orbit Ion Cannon, LOIC. Um, it's one of the more common, I guess more popular for the, um, the, 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 the college student aged or you know, bedroom hackers, <laughs> if you want to call them that, where this is an app you run on your – and by the way, it's illegal to do this, so I should preface that. But this is what it looks like, right? So a user can come in, type in an IP address or a host name, decide what port they want to hit, they decide how fast they want to hit it, and some of these tools are very sophisticated. And you could say, I want to attack these ports at this rate, I want to do 100 attacks per second, and it's just going to hammer it with requests until the thing can't handle it. And this is where anything like an SBC or a gateway or something more secure than just a firewall on the network um, can help, particularly because an SBC understands voice traffic and um, can recognize those threats and see, hey, I'm getting a bunch of requests from the same IP or same ranges of IPs, or I'm just getting flooded, and it can take preventative action. And toll fraud is a biggie. Um, if you actually do the Go on Google, or sorry, go on Bing. That's what Microsoft likes us to say. And uh, you know, go look up toll fraud violations and toll fraud in the news. Um, international Revenue Share Fraud, IRSF, is one of the most common toll fraud schemes out there. Uh, I've even posted an article here um, where a gentleman, Mohammed Kismani, uh, who is who's Pakistani, uh, had set up a whole bunch of um, – we call them premium numbers here in the United States, right? But numbers that carry a toll charge. Um, in the U.S., you might call these 976 numbers or 1-900 numbers. Um, but those are numbers that when you dial them, right, you're, you're paying a premium to dial them, something like 499 per minute. And what this gentleman had done was he had infiltrated several businesses' voice networks and used free extensions and free stations to automatically place calls to premium numbers where he got a cut. Right? So I set up a premium service where if you call me, you're going to pay me five bucks a minute. And then you know, he sets up the scam and he gets maybe half of that. Right? And he did this for a number of years. What does the article say there? 2008 through 2012, almost $20 million in bogus charges. This is just one guy. You know? And this is him infiltrating voice networks, setting up these toll fraud schemes, and just essentially using an auto dialer to just call his own premium numbers to get paid. Right? So toll fraud is a biggie. So how do we secure Skype, and really how do we secure any voice environment? Uh, but I wanted to talk about this in the context of Skype for Business. So what is, it, what is an SBC? Um, not just what does it stand for, but what does it actually do? And then how is this different from a firewall, and how do I work with firewalls? I'm even going to show you some real-world customer examples. <clears throat> so an S SBC stands for Session Border Controller. The easy, if you don't know anything about it, the easiest way to think about it is it's a firewall for voice. 
Um, firewalls are great for you know, data traffic, things like email and web traffic. And you know, they chop up the packets and then reassemble them on the other side, and boom, firewall. Um, that doesn't often work very well for, for voice. So this is where an SPC comes into play. So an SPC typically sits at the edge of the network, and it's there to work as a firewall for voice, right? So I'm there to help with signaling, setting up, and tearing down of calls. Um, so it's kind of extending your voice infrastructure to the edge. And if you've terminated SIP trunks before, you're probably familiar with that kind of design because that's what you have to do. If a SIP provider wants to turn up a trunk, they're going to call you and ask you and say, hey, what, what's the IP address of your SBC? And that needs to be routable from them, right? So that could be an added IP or what have you. But you're going to have that SBC on the edge. So let's look at it visually, right? So here's, here's your, your lovely data network, your data, your data center that you spent decades building. It's only got a couple of things in it, right? But I've got PCs, I've got users, I've got phones, I've got you know, routers and switches and hubs. Hubs, geez, who has hubs? Um, and all this stuff in my data center, right? And hey, good for you. You built a firewall. And when I've got my corporate OC3 coming in or whatever have you for your data connection, I've got a firewall there to make sure that nothing happens that I don't want, right? You've got to pass through my gate to get into my network. Well, now here comes a SIP provider, right? I want to come in and terminate a SIP trunk. Well, I can't get through that firewall um, in a lot of cases. That firewall is going to block that traffic. It typically doesn't really know how to handle voice. Um, in some cases where we've tried to, uh, I want to say we, I've tried to use firewalls um, to terminate trunks. What they do is they, they chop up and cut up the packets, reassemble them on the other end, and just resend them, right? And that tends to work really good for things like email and web traffic. But with voice, that doesn't really play all that well. And you, send, you get one-way audio or you get dead air, and it just doesn't work, right? So, okay, my firewall is not going to work for voice traffic. Um, what do I do? Well, I can open up a hole. I can, the SIP provider can say, hey, here, here are the ports that you need to open. You need to open this, uh, TCP 5061, 5068, and then I need UDP range 10,000 through you know, 59,000. And that, that would actually work, but look what you've done with your firewall, right? You built a fence, and then you punched a big hole in it and said, okay, go through there. Well, what's to prevent anybody from going through there, right? So this is where an SBC comes into the mix, right? So SBC sits on the edge. It kind of works with firewalls. And it, it, in a lot of deployments that I do of SBCs, um, we work with a, a, a firewall on one or either side. And that allows me to terminate that SIP traffic securely. It understands how to do it. It's a back-to-back -back user agent. Um, hey, I'm going to go to the next slide and talk about that. So when I've got SIP traffic coming in through a firewall, the whole leg is going all the way to the call to PBX, right? In this case, Skype for Business. The whole call leg is going to Skype for Business, and it's coming out. The whole leg is going there. Um, with an SBC, I've got a back-to-back -back user agent. And what that means is the SBC is sitting in the middle, and it's making sure that all the streams are going to who they need to go to. Um, so all the internal legs are isolated from the external legs. And this helps to ensure quality, helps to ensure security, um, helps to make sure that calls are routed properly, and um, it helps with the logic of preventing things like toll fraud and issues with routing. So the question is, you know, why, why deploy an SBC? Well, I kind of highlighted these already, right? So it's secure, right? You need an SBC on-prem to secure your voice networks. Um, SBCs have a lot of intelligence in, in them to dictate how things are routed. Um, there's some SBCs out there, in fact, the enterprise grade ones, that will implicitly block any traffic unless you build a route for it. Right? So um, you have to specifically build out the dial plan. And it helps to event, prevent things like toll bypass and toll fraud. And then what I see most of all is uh, the last point there, interworking. Um, so let's say I've got a PBX. I'm going to use Avaya. Right? So I've got an Avaya communication manager. Maybe an Avaya session manager. Um, heck, maybe it's an asterisk. I don't know. And, and I need to integrate that with Skype for Business. Now you can try to build a SIP trunk directly between the two. But what I often find with SIP is that it's kind of like Mandarin and Cantonese, right? Both Chinese dialects. <laughs> and you could probably understand most of what you're saying if I speak Mandarin and you speak Cantonese. Um, but with SIP, it's, it's kind of akin to that. I might get everything, but I might lose a few words here and there, and that can cause major issues. So having an SBC in the mix helps to have kind of a middleman <laughs> mediate that traffic and make sure that things get terminated properly and avoid issues like hairpinning. 
so in a lot of deployments that I'm doing with Skype for Business and Office 365, we're coming from this legacy environment, right? I've got analog phones. I've got colleges that have those emergency call boxes on campus. I've got multi-purpose devices like fax machines, printer fax scanners. Um, I've got third-party phones that may not work with Skype for Business. I've got trunks. I've got all of this stuff. Um, and the magic bullet and that, that, that makes all of this integration work well is often a gateway or an SBC. Um, it's the way of building a bridge between these two disparate islands, right? I've got my Avaya island. I've got my Skype for Business island, whether it be on-prem or online. And an SBC in between can help make sure those bridges between them are stable and that voice traffic can route effectively. So real-world examples, right? So here, I want to put some customer examples on here of examples where I've done SBC deployments with Sonus and, and kind of the solutions they've solved, right? Um, names have been removed to... What's the term? Keep the innocent, I don't know. Um, so in this customer environment, we have a Skype for Business running on premise, right? So this customer came to us and said, hey, I've, I use WebEx. We use WebEx for our meetings. We pay through the nose every month for WebEx. We've got a Skype environment. Can we build that out and maybe use that for our conferencing? And the answer is absolutely. So we build out the Skype for Business environment on prem, and then the question comes up, well, hey, how do I terminate trunks to this? And for conferencing, something like WebEx, you're talking about a lot of connections, right? It's not just one or two. It's dozens. It's sometimes hundreds of voice calls, depending on the number of meetings. Um, this organization happens to be in about the 10,000 user range. Um, and on-premise, they had an Avaya environment, right? They had an Avaya PBX, and that's where their phones were, and that's the, how they got to the PSTN. And they said, you know, we're not really, we're not really trunked for that on the PBX. We don't have enough capacity to bring all of these meeting calls into our PBX. So what else can we do? And we said, hey, let's put an SBC out there and get some new trunks there. These trunks are just for conferencing. Um, they're brand new. They're SIP trunks, and we'll put an SBC in. And in this case, the SBC gets placed effectively in the DMZ. Right? So what they wanted, um, they work in healthcare, so they're very security conscious. Um, they wanted firewalls on both sides. They want an internal firewall and an external firewall. And that's no problem. So you put the SBC logically in between the firewalls. Um, the SBC or the SIP trunk provider tells you um, the port ranges that you're getting, the IP addresses that they're going to be coming from, all of that, so that you can effectively open up that hole in your external firewall and use the SBC to plug it. So calls come through the external firewall, hit the SBC, and with the intelligent routing, the SBC could actually route the call to the Avaya switch if it needed to. Um, but predominantly what we were using this for was to route calls to Skype for Business. So in lieu of turning up new trunks on the existing PBX environment, um, bringing in SIP trunks seemed to be the most cost-effective method. And frankly, you can burst that sizing, right? So if uh, conferencing increases, which studies show conferencing increases, I think, at a rate of about 12% year over year. So if you did 1,000, you know, for example, 1,000 minutes of conferencing last year, next year you're going to do 1,200, something like that, right? Um, oh, and last on this is you know, the idea of public IP addressing. So with your SBC on the edge, um, the SBC, or the SIP trunk provider needs to tell you, you know, needs to talk to your, your environment somehow. And the way you do that is you give that SBC a public IP address. And security guys always go, you know, I'm not giving a public IP address to something sitting in my data center unfettered. Um, and the good news there is we can NAT it, right? I can give you a NATed public IP address that comes in through the firewall. Um, but it's also important to note that the SBC is, in essence, a firewall. It does a lot of the same stuff that a firewall does. It does um, access control lists and, and, and all of that. Um, and it actually even has certificate capabilities so that we can do encryption and all of that. So it does sit on the edge. It does need a public IP. Um, but we can actually NAT that IP to enforce a layer of security on top of what we've already built. So here, here's another customer example, right? So this customer came to us and said, hey, um, we've got our 20-year-old PBX that has a Kickstarter, an air filter, and a gas tank, and we need to eventually sunset it. But you know what? The 20- or 30-year-old voicemail platform that we had sitting there, it, it, it died. And um, we don't have any backup parts for it because it's so old. And you know, we, we really quickly need to get voicemail up and running. And the solution here was 
use Exchange Online. So Exchange Online Unified Messaging is essentially voicemail in the cloud. Right? And so what we would do is the same thing that we did in the previous example. Stick an SBC in the perimeter DMZ and allow that SBC to talk to Exchange Online. And so the flow here would be you know, a, a, a caller hits the phone on the bottom there and it rings four times. Eventually it covers, goes to voicemail. That PBX will send that covered call to the SBC. The SBC looks at that and goes, okay, this is from a valid station. Uh, it's on this environment. It needs to go up here. And it sends it to Exchange Online. And on the Exchange Online side, you actually get a DNS name of where to send that traffic. And so call goes all the way up to the cloud into the user's email container and um, keeps their voice messages stored. And then on the way back, it sends a light, right? Because you want that light on your phone to light up. So that MWI, that message waiting indication, comes back through the SBC. The SBC says, oh, this is from Exchange Online. I see it there. I can see the, the, the history of this call. I can see that it came as a result of this. I'm going to send it back to the PBX core and light that phone. Um, this is different than how Skype does it, right? If you've got Skype for Business running on-prem, you've got an edge server, and that edge server talks to Office 365. But I can't just put a line between my PBX core and that, those Skype for Business servers. It, it doesn't work that way. There's none of, I, can't, I can't get lights to light going through that path. I might be able to get the call to route, but you won't get that full voicemail functionality with it. But same questions, right? I need a public certificate. I need a public IP address. How do I do that? Well, we've got firewall rules to build, um, but we can surmount this thing with firewalls. And then last but not least, um, Cloud PBX. So a lot of people are talking about Skype for Business and Cloud PBX, and what does that mean, right? So Cloud PBX is Microsoft's hosted, if you want to call it that, voice solution, right? So if you've got Skype online, you can go to Microsoft and say, give me a phone number. And boom, there you go. You've got a phone number. It's not yours. I mean, Microsoft owns it. They own the, the responsibility of making sure that it works. But you could just go and request a phone number, and boom, you've got Cloud PBX. Now, the thing with Cloud PBX is it's only available in a couple of countries for those numbers. I think the only countries where you can actually get telephone numbers from Microsoft are the U.S., the U.K., uh, Puerto Rico, France, Ireland, uh, Spain, and there's a couple in preview. I know Germany is in preview and Belgium is in preview. And the reason for that is you know, telephony is a regulated utility in just about every country. And in order for Microsoft to be able to issue phone numbers, they need to have that relationship and that agreement in place. Um, this will never happen in India, I don't think. In India's telecom regulations are so strict that they'd be hard-pressed to, to get that working. But it's only available in a couple of countries right now where you can go online and say, give me a phone number. Is Canada on there? I think they are. Maybe. Who knows? Um, but in those, so in those countries where we can't get phone numbers, what do I do? Well, there's a concept of something called a cloud connector edition. And what it is, it's essentially a couple of VMs that sit on-prem that allow you to terminate trunks. That's it. Hang on one second. So it's a, it's a, it's a set of VMs on-prem that allow you to terminate trunks, just trunks. Users don't sit on this. There's no conferencing happening on this. The sole purpose of this box is to terminate trunks. And so you've got users online, and you go into Office 365, and you say, hey, um, Patrick's going to be on Skype for Business online, but you know what? I want him to use trunks from the Netherlands um, or, or, or Poland. Well, I've got to have one of these boxes in Poland, and then I could terminate trunks locally. And it's kind of the same questions, right? How do I do that? Um, well, we, we've got some turnkey boxes essentially where you, you stick a box on-prem. It's essentially, it's got the same functions as an SBC. It's got firewall capability. It's got trunk capability. And it's there simply to terminate trunks to enable dial tone for Cloud PBX. Um, in this case, the customer that we're working with on this is multinational. Offices in a lot of countries. I think the first one we've done is Japan where Cloud PBX phone numbers aren't available. So boom, you put your users in Skype for Business online, you put this Cloud Connector Edition on-prem, and boom, I've got dial tone in Japan. Um, so those are just a couple of different examples of how we've deployed SBCs, um, what problems they've solved for Skype users, even some Exchange users, um, all of that. So I think I've got one more poll question. And hey, I do. Do I have music for this one? I think I do. Oh, 
I should probably read it, right? Have you deployed Skype for Business? Here's the question. Okay, that's enough of that. Um, but they're still coming in. Jeez. Um, I'm going to give it like two more seconds. Oh, that's close enough. That seems to be 2,000 out of the 3,000 of you that have joined. So here are the results, right? So have you deployed Skype for Business? Um, wow, I'm, I'm actually kind of surprised by this one. I was expecting a lot more online. So predominantly people have deployed Skype on-prem in some way, shape, or form. And, and this is congruent with what we see, right? So when I, when I see a customer um, for the first time, usually it's, yeah, we've deployed Skype for Business just for the IT guys. We haven't really rolled it out there, but we haven't quite figured it out. And a big part of that tends to be because of security. We don't know how to scale it. We don't know how to secure it. There's a lot of external traffic and public IPs and certificates, and it's just a big headache. So we've got it on-prem, but eh, it's not really doing much. So that, 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 that's pretty congruent with that. Um, now to expect the Skype for Business online um, tally to go quite a bit higher, um, only because of the ease of deployment. Um, but one option I didn't put in the poll was, was, was hybrid, right? So there might be a blend there between hybrid and online. Um, people still running Link Server, very common as well. I'm still seeing quite a bit of Link Server 2010 and Link Server 2013. There's some features in there that were deprecated that people still want to hang on to. Um, no on the, the Skype for Business deployment. Um, uh, very surprising. Like I said, 90% of Fortune 500s have deployed it in some way, shape, or form. Who knows? Maybe it's deployed somewhere and you just can't get to it because only the IT guys and gals can get it. And uh, obviously, I don't know. So. Um, with that, um, that, that's kind of, like I said, congruent with what I've seen. That's an overview of kind of what SBCs do and how we play with firewalls. Um, if there's questions, I'm happy to take them at the end. But for now, um, I'm going to pass it over to Umar Kabir, who's going to talk about kind of the portfolio and the different speed feeds and kind of the solutions that they solve. Umar, are you still out there with us? I am indeed. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, so just a few words about myself. Actually, I believe uh, John had mentioned that for the last 10 years or so, I've been uh, working uh, at Sonus and a company that Sonus had acquired back in 2012, uh, Network Equipment Technologies. And what I'd been doing was, was a product management role surrounding what is now termed the SBC 1000-2000. At Sonus, I also have the responsibility for product management surrounding the SWE Lite, which is in effect the virtualized version of our Session Border Controller 1000-2000 products. I've also had uh, in previous lives roles as a uh, developer, uh, working in sales, marketing, and as mentioned, uh, product management. And I'm based in Ottawa, Canada. So uh, before I go and just spend some time on this uh, slide here, I did notice that there was a few questions which had been posed in the Q&A uh, window. So uh, regarding the link to the presentation materials, uh, yes, we will forward that the content to you. Uh, John, maybe what you can do is uh, once we're close to wrapping up, you can just mention what the protocol is to uh, get the content. There's another question with regards to, is the session border controller the same thing as a gateway? Uh, what you often find is that session border controllers do support gateway-related functions. But there is a subtle distinction between the two. And the distinction is the session border controller really talks about supporting those security functions related to bridging a public voice over IP network, so a public SIP-based network, to your SIP-based network on the private side within your enterprise. Okay, So you're going SIP to SIP, public to private, and vice versa. In the case of the gateway, it's a very similar, but the difference is that instead of going SIP to SIP, what you're doing, you're going SIP to a legacy protocol. So something like, for example, primary rate interface, PRI, BRI, 
FXS ports, FXO ports. So that's typically where you see that term being used. Uh, in the case of the session border controllers that Sonus happens to make available, uh, the SPC 1000 and 2000 uh, supports both of these roles. Although we happen to term it as being a session border controller, you will see as we go through uh, some of the uh, subsequent slides that uh, a few of these SPCs do also support gateway-related functions. So I hope that answers your question. And then with regards to Patty, I, I hope uh, the, the voice issue has been corrected. Okay, so what to look for in a session border controller here? Uh, what you want to do is you do want to look for a session border controller from a vendor who's had a product in the marketplace for some time. You know, this is a vendor, you know, who's undertaken testing with third-party uh, validation houses, for example, vendors that have their session border controllers deployed in public and uh, and enterprise environments for some time and have gained the experience of being able to bridge various forms of one, uh, one form of SIP to another, as Patrick had mentioned before. And someone who's had these products deployed, you know, in, in really very demanding environments. So these are the kinds of things which you want to really be considering as you go about thinking about a session border controller and a vendor from whom you're going to be acquiring that product. Interoperability is another big one. As Patrick had mentioned before, what you're going to be looking to do is to bridge many different SIP environments together. And the, the more longer a session border controller has been deployed in the marketplace, typically what you see is a much broader breadth of interoperability interoperability supporting many legacy, uh, many legacy protocols and many different flavors of session initiation protocol coming from disparate telecom vendors. Hey, hey Flexibility. Omar, can I jump in there? Yes. So, yeah, I, I wanted to add on the interop because I, I thought of another example. I wish I'd built a slide on it, but I think one of the more complex ones that we've done was an environment where, as you said, it's legacy voice, right? So I've got an Avaya system. This customer had a Nortel system. They had an old Roam system sitting out there somewhere. Um, you know, some of it's PRI, some of it's SIP, some of it's, you know, E1. You know, it's, it's, it's an, an amalgamation of different PBXs, and the, the big question is, how do I bring all this together? And, and that's kind of the same story, right? So an SBC and a gateway in the middle can help bridge that. I just wanted to add that example. No worries. Thank you for that. And then uh, we have the point about flexibility. Move to Skype for Business Online at your own pace. So one of the things, so what we mean by that is as you go about transitioning from, let's say, for example, a Skype for Business on-premises deployment, and you're gradually migrating to Skype for Business Online, you want to be sure you have a session border controller that can support that gradual shift and be able to allow you to move to, to the online uh, offering from Microsoft without necessarily any additional CapEx, any additional spend on a session border controller hardware for you to be able to take advantage of the Cloud PBX features. Last thing, you also want to keep in mind 24-by-7 uh, 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 monitoring. Do you have a vendor who has a worldwide presence who is in a position to be able to provide support services 24 by 7 and be able to provide you with those support services, you know, regardless of uh, where you happen to be based? So these are the things which you want to keep in mind as you go about selecting a vendor for your session border controller. Okay, uh, just a few words about, um, about Sonus and what we'd like to think is our, our trusted vendor uh, designation. You know, uh, we have our products deployed in the world's leading tier one service provider environments. And that goes all the way back to the early 2000s 
uh, you know, with our GSX product line, uh, where we came out with some of the first initial uh, gateways for deployment within a service provider environment. What we were doing is uh, we were able to offer these products being able to support thousands of calls and allowing the bridging to occur between legacy, legacy networks that were based on SS7, for example, and be able to bridge those over to IP within the service provider environment. We've been doing that for well over a decade. You know, it's almost uh, reaching uh, the end of the second decade. Another thing to account for is that our products are deployed in not just small businesses, but also many, many large enterprises as well. Uh, these are uh, very large banks, airlines, retailers. If you go onto our website, for example, you'll see a few case studies related to uh, some of the world's largest um, oil and gas manufacturers uh, and producers who have deployed our products in support of uh, Skype for Business rollout, just as an example. And then we also wanted to point out that we have our products also heavily deployed within, um, within very demanding military type of deployments. And so, for example, here, 350 U.S. Department of Defense uh, locations. So uh, just something which we'd like to ensure that you're aware of. So getting into the, um, the broad SBC portfolio, uh, the products which I happen to manage are really those set of products right at the top, uh, top row of this slide. So as you can see, the SBC Sui Light, which is in effect a virtualized version of the products that you see over to the right, the Sonus SBC 1000 and the SBC 2000, what that in effect allows you to be able to do is to take this Sui Light and deploy it on your own um, x86 server within a virtual uh, machine environment and thereby be able to more rapidly deploy your session border controller. If you have a spare uh, server sitting around or within your rack where you happen to host your firewalls, if you happen to have a few virtual machines, you can actually, or even if you have one virtual machine with one virtual CPU and one gig of RAM, you can go ahead and deploy this and get support for 100 sessions. Now, uh, as we move forward uh, through the year, um, in the September-October time frame, what I'd like to do is to do uh, another session to our partner base and to the market at large about some of the exciting things that we have in terms of enhancements to this product, where we're looking to dramatically increase the capacity and even improve the capacity within that current footprint that I just walked you through the one virtual CPU and the, and the one gig of RAM that we consider to be market leading. On the Session Border Controller 1000, what you have is a device which supports approximately 200 simultaneous sessions. And so we, we didn't get into exactly what we mean by a session, but think of a session as just being a call. So this device can support up to 200 calls, and that's good enough for a small business or a medium-sized business that has up to about 1,000 to 2,000 users. Uh, in the case of the SBC 2000, which you see over to the far right, that device supports up to 600 sessions, good enough for small to medium business or site locations where you have approximately 5,000 seats or so. Uh, on the case of the, the other products that we happen to sell, we have the 5000 series, which you see in the middle row. And you can also see uh, the products that we have on the bottom, on the, bottom uh, the SBC SWE and the SBC 7000. Uh, what we do there, these are products which support high capacity deployments in large enterprise, for example, as well as service provider environments as well. So as you can see, we have a very, very broad portfolio here, a broad portfolio that can meet the needs of enterprises who are looking for a session border controller that can handle uh, a wide variation of call flows.
Uh, we also uh, happen to have uh, remote configuration services. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this over to Patrick for a moment. Uh, Patrick, did you want to say a few things about uh, some of the, the services that you happen to provide from an Arrow perspective in support of session border controller deployments? Sure. Yeah, so you know, as, as I pointed to out and alluded to before, you know, obviously Arrow works very, very closely with Sonus. Um, and what that effectively allows us to do is to deploy um, those products and those services. Uh, I don't want to say on our own, but we have the capability of doing that kind of turnkey, right? So in a lot of cases, if I'm already in there helping to deploy Skype for Business and Office 365, you know, I, I don't necessarily need to bring in the Sonus engineers to do that. I kind of provide that as a turnkey solution. So I'm not reaching into Sonus to, to grab their guys or gals and make them quote unquote part of the project, right? So um, that's the thing that Arrow does is we can deploy the gateways. We've, we've done some vir the, the virtual machine deployments. We can do the dial plan configurations, all of that. And frankly, if we get in really stuck somewhere, that's when I call Sonus. Uh, but predominantly, I do the deployment of these, the support of them ongoing. Um, I, I take tickets weekly um, for minor issues that need to be resolved. So um, that, that's where Arrow can help with that. Thanks. So moving on, uh, just a few things which we just wanted to highlight regarding uh, the user interface. Uh, when you do go about looking for a, uh, an SPC vendor, you also want to consider the costs associated with bringing up the service, the costs associated with becoming familiar with the device in question. Uh, what we tend to, to uh, ask enterprises who are looking at a wide variety of session border controllers coming from different vendors, also consider the ease of use associated with the device. Is it easy, for example, to bring the device up? Can the device be provisioned quickly and easily? Another thing to keep in mind is when you go about making configuration changes, do the configuration changes require a complete reboot, which requires that the session border controller go down and take down active calls? So those are the kinds of things which you want to keep in mind regarding the ease of use and how to go about managing the device that uh, will help you towards your selection of session border controller. Interoperability, you know, we've discussed that uh, quite a bit. Uh, you want, to, most of the times what we find is that, as Patrick had mentioned, you know, customers have widely disparate telecom, uh, telecom networks deployed within their enterprise. Maybe they're looking for a transition at a future point in time. Maybe they have a service provider relationship which is based on PRI, and at some point in the future they want to move to SIP. You want to look at a session border controller solution that can support the transition from a legacy interface like PRI to SIP without necessarily requiring any sort of forklift upgrade. That is purchasing another piece of equipment or decommissioning the previous uh, gateway or session border controller. So consider that as you go about looking at your session border controller solution. And then something with respect to the kinds of features that the session border controller may make available within uh, a particular deployment. You know, consider to what degree the session border controller is able to accommodate uh, call flows that may bridge legacy endpoints as well as uh, SIP endpoints. What we tend to find is that there may be a session border controller solution which can support, you know, a wide degree of interworking between uh, one SIP endpoint coming from one vendor and a SIP endpoint coming from another vendor. But they may not necessarily be flexible enough to be able to support interworking between, let's say, a SIP endpoint and a potential uh, another SIP endpoint as being one possible endpoint alongside an endpoint that may not be SIP-based. So one of the things which we like to, to, to mention is consider the flexibility of being able to reach many different types of clients 
Does your session border controller actually support those? Now with respect to the flexibility of session border controllers that come from Sonus, the deployment configurations that we support, as, as mentioned earlier by Patrick, you know, it's a wide variety, that being on-premise with regards to hybrid, cloud, or multi-vendor, all of those different interoperability scenarios or all those different deployment scenarios we happen to support, including, for example, deployments which require the cloud connector addition that Patrick had mentioned uh, previously, as well as uh, survivable branch appliance uh, products in support of Skype for Business on-premise, and so on. Uh, so, yeah, just just another slide that we just really wanted to to leave you with. Uh, security threats, they're real. You know, we probably, you have heard uh, in the last few months or so some of the attacks which have uh, come about uh, as a result of that um, um, that uh, anti-ransomware, the WannaCry, and then there was another one that occurred uh, shortly thereafter. You know, you, you want to be sure that you're looking for products that are not going to go down, that are able to deal with these kinds of threats uh, reliably and uh, without failure so that you can keep your enterprise as productive as possible and to ensure that you're maximizing your revenue. Uh, Patrick, did you want to say anything further on this slide here? No, I, I don't think so. I mean, sure. <laughs> uh, we're seeing, I see it a couple of times a year. I, I've had a couple of customers call and say, hey, I've got about $16,000 in charges on my bill that, um, on my provider bill that I didn't account for. And lo and behold, we go and we take a look at some logs and somebody's dialing in in the middle of the night, grabbing a trunk and placing international calls. I, I, I've seen this in real life and, and you know, there's solutions to solve that. Um, but, but as you point out, Amar, it's, there, there's, <laughs> it's prevalent. You see these, uh, these things in the news about DDoS attacks and you know, as you said, the wanna cries and things that are uh, malicious. It's not just data. It, it happens in the voice world. Um, maybe just the voice world doesn't get into the news that often, but <laughs> it does happen, as you said. Right. Thank you. So moving on, we also have a, an incident management as a, as a service uh, feature that um, you can also look to engage from us uh, through Arrow. And uh, there will be uh, subsequent um, webinars on that particular topic to discuss that in a little more detail. Arrow system integration. I'm going to turn this over to, to Patrick. Who put this slide together? Oh, I did. <laughs> um, this is a, yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to leave with, you know, the, the kind of the Arrow SI story and how we play with Sonus. So obviously we're a Sonus partner. We handle support. We handle maintenance. We handle deployments. But we also provide kind of the turnkey solution for just about everything you can see in the Microsoft stack. Um, we're focusing predominantly on Exchange and Skype for Business and the Office 365 story. Um, but there's quite a bit more in, in, in that in, in terms of the infrastructure needed, the networking side, the security side. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of like my, here's why we're the best slide and here's how, how we work really, really well with Sonus, particularly on things like Exchange, Skype, and Office. Great. Well, I see people Thank want you. my contact info. Um, I guess we can share my contact info, sure. Why not, right? Why not? <laughs> Just Google me. Sorry, Bing me. Bing so, me. and again, as we, uh, as I and Patrick have mentioned before, what you can look at to acquire from Sonus includes not only session border controllers, but session border controllers that happen to feature the Cloud Connector Edition, as in support of Skype for Business on -roll online deployments, uh, survivable branch appliance products in support of Skype for Business on-premises deployments. And with that, you can get configuration services and incident management uh, through partners like Arrow. 
Uh, you can learn more from us. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to John Ryan for some closing comments. And as you can see here, we do have a uh, Securing Real-Time Communications for Dummies book. If you'd like to get a copy, uh, John will be happy to point out how you can go about acquiring that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, one last thing. Uh, one last thing before I, I turn it over to you, John. I saw that there was a few more questions here. Uh, what, what I'll do is uh, I'll answer those questions offline. Those questions regarding, uh, for example, the support of GSM, and also pricing with respect to the Sonus SBC 1000. Uh, the, the Sonus SBC 1000, we're looking at roughly a little over, uh, I think the, the base entry model in the session border controller configuration starts at uh, 1,300 US dollars or so. That's the list price, the list price. Okay, with that, I'll turn it over to John. Thank you, Omar. Um, as he mentioned, um, we have this ebook, Securing Real-Time Communications for Dummies. That's a great way to learn more about security and how to implement that into your communications, particularly um, Skype for Business or other um, real communication that you may have on your network. And um, anything else regarding questions with saunas, questions with RSI, um, you can contact us. Uh, Patrick had his contact email listed before on ppayette, P-P-A-Y-E-T-T-E -T -T -E at arrowsi.com. Um, that's where you can contact Patrick. Um, if you want to contact saunas, you can contact us particularly with Skype for Business questions at this email, teammicrosoft at saunasnet.com. And now I'll close things forward. Thank you so much to our presenters, Umar Kabir and Patrick Payet, as well as our attendees for joining us on this webinar. And we'll have webinar materials emailed to you within 24 hours. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.